Is that born here? Peter, come on in. This afternoon I have a statement to make about uh, the drug abuse problem following which uh, Dr. Peter Bourne will be available to answer specific questions. Pete, come on up. Today I'm sending Congress a message which expresses my strong concern about the crime and sickness and death caused by the abuse of drugs, including barbiturates and alcohol. This is a film about presidential policy, how it is formulated and presented in the shape of a speech or presidential message. The policy we've chosen is about drugs, and the man responsible was Jimmy Carter's aide, Dr. Peter Bourne. I think that we need to make a big point, which we've kind of missed completely, of saying, since I've been in office, we already have achieved major success. The purity of heroin is the lowest that it's ever been. And I'm willing to take a risk on getting criticized on the methodology. The, the purity in Mexico? Yeah. Purity in Mexico. Anything else? There are still a lot of kind of little phrases in here that I don't like. Um, cutting through the imagery and folklore of soft and hard. Does, does that, is that... Was that your...? Oh, no. No, I have no pride in that. authorship. <laughs> That's not me. Um, that, that may be Sybil. The most important new departure in terms of a policy change is to say drug abuse is now a global problem and we've got to deal with it as a global problem and we can no longer say American policy is to keep drugs out of America. You naturally lead into the, th the, the whole rest of the international mm -hmm. thing. And what I hope to do is to have another draft to you before you leave for Columbia. It's okay. tomorrow morning. Yes. Yes, well, that's all right. They've been doing okay. something with really... And then what I would hope is that you could use some of that time to well, really polish well. it and put your final comments on it. And then when it gets back, to maybe sit down, when you get back, to sit down with Sybil and do a quick circulation, I'll have her prepare a memo asking for a 24-hour turnaround. Yes. From the cabinet? From the cabinet. What's the purpose behind the document? That it, um, in effect, makes official any policy that we develop when it carries the imprimatur of the president. This means that everybody in the government knows that this is the new policy that they now will follow. To some extent, we can do that anyway, um, but it carries special endorsement when the president has uh, made the statement. And also, if one is making any significant changes, as we in fact are, uh, to make it really effective, one needs to have the president make the statement. In addition, a lot of these things require charging cabinet officers to carry out certain functions within their agencies, and it's very hard to do that uh, unless you have the authority of the president clearly saying, this is what I want done. As you probably know, the Office of Drug Abuse Policy was set up under a law passed by the Congress. Our job is to make sure that there is coordination between DEA, the State Department, NIDA, the VA, the Department of Defense, all of the federal agencies that are involved in drug abuse. I haven't talked to the Kolomba people about the crop substitution program in the last couple of weeks, but I did send them a note after my meeting with the Thai ambassador. Yeah, right. Uh, just to tell them that he was very receptive to the idea of their involvement and also to reiterate to them that the Thai government really is interested in the crop substitution program and really wants to actively support it. Have they been in touch with the other people in their consortium or in the, in the industry? If DEA stays alone, you maintain their international presence. But if they are merged into the FBI, then you have another option of, of putting the international activity in another agency at some point in time. 
and I think we have to get some resolution to that before our report actually comes out. I'm not sure that the first choice doesn't have a lot of merit because if we are the people making the decisions, we're, we're going to really be the bad guys in the thing. And I don't know how we can come out of it then without really having enemies around the government. Just tell him that I met no. with, with the president to talk about future cooperation. Did you get any commitments by the Amy Hearst? That we're going to have, uh, I, I think you can probably tell him that we're going to set up a, a high level coordinating committee between the two countries. And uh, he's, he's made the strongest commitment to give this a high priority. Okay, and then President Carter is aware of it. Yes, he is. Yes. You might, you might tell him that I went down there to follow up on Mrs. Carter's trip and on President Carter's instructions to meet with Lopez Michael Smith Nicholson. Okay. Turn in. Sure. I'm sorry I didn't get uh, everything finished. That's it. This is what we have. How does it look? It looks fine. Here's what we have. We need your ending. The best we can do, I think, is send it out Monday. And this is just, and we'll change it to close it since Tuesday. We want their comments back. Uh, Jenny says that if we get it finished today, the White House messengers won't get it out to the cabinet. I'd like to get it out tomorrow, and Sarah can take care of just mailing it to them so that it would be there first thing Monday morning. In 1969, I went back to Georgia, and about that time, drugs were becoming an increasingly severe problem in Georgia. Then Governor Carter, who was later to become president, asked me if I would make recommendations to him as to what he should do about the problem. He and I came here to Washington and looked at the treatment programs here in Washington. He then asked me to leave the medical school where I was teaching and go to work for him full time, which I did. We set up a large central intake facility in Atlanta and then about a dozen little treatment facilities which would provide long-term care for about 150 addicts. And that, that's really how I, how I got into it. This is a dispensing area, yes. This is uh, one of our nurses. The last time I visited an NTA facility mm -hmm. was in 1971 when Jimmy Carter and I came here from Georgia. You, you think that you probably have the toughest patient population here at this? I feel that the number that's not seeking treatment is much larger than the number that we have in treatment, or uh, that we have come in, you know, for treatment. Thank you. Problem with your veins. Mm -hmm. I ain't got none. Have they ever bothered you with infected veins? Anything of that type? Mm -hmm. Not really. You ever had tuberculosis? Pneumonia? Mm -hmm. No, no man. My sinus troubles. Mm -hmm. Are you allergic to any drugs or foods? Obviously, if you have 247,000 people in treatment as we have right now, that's 247,000 people who would probably otherwise be using heroin. On that basis, one can say that one has reduced the demand for heroin. Brown, would one of you come see about Mr. Palmer, please? He's sleeping in the chair, snowing. Thank you. Sleeping in the chair, snowing. 
-hmm. You won't be able to complete this now, Paul. Maybe in about an hour, a couple of hours, you might be able to. Just to get the holes in everything. Yes. On the other hand, in terms of it being a significant strategic component in the overall strategy to eliminate addiction, I don't think it's that valid. I'm going back into the church. You're back and forth to church. I'm going back into the church. Oh, you're going back into it. I'm church. getting into it more and more. I think all of my feelings about this really derive from my own treatment experience. People could argue that you could control the heroin addiction problem by increasing the employment rate, that you could build better housing, that you could give people better education and better jobs. All of those things are probably true, but for a practical standpoint, to go after the problem in that direction is just totally unrealistic. It's, it's almost like saying you're going to do a tonsillectomy on somebody, but that you're going to do it through the stomach. Just seeing people on the street and what the effect of the availability of heroin does to the use on the spread of heroin absolutely convinced me that of all the things that you potentially had some ability to control, supply was the single most important crucial element. What we have is all the comments from the agencies and from OMB and from Stu Eisenstadt. And they've raised some major problems which they're concerned about, which I, some of which I just don't think that we can resolve. There are also a lot of relatively minor wording changes mm -hmm. and what Rick Hutchison wants us to do is just to consolidate those wording changes where we can so that we can get rid of the objection, the minor objections. If you could Xerox copies of the, all of the comments, and what I will do is take your summary, attach everybody's comments, and send them to Rick so that he has a package. Then once I've made the change, I'll get it over to you to get it retyped. Okay. And that, then we should be to a point of having it in a final form where he can send it into the president. And if there are major areas of disagreement still, as I think there will be, then we'll leave it up to the president to decide whether he accepts our arguments or, or goes the other way um, with whatever OMB or HEW or Justice decides. The point that we're at now is that the message has been circulated by the uh, secretary to the president to the heads of the different departments, the cabinet officers, and to the other staff here in the White House who are responsible for specific areas for the president, such as the head of congressional relations, the head of policy planning. They are people who are on an equal level with myself as, a, as special assistants to the president. The comments really fall into two categories. Those from the uh, cabinet officers generally relate to um, wording changes where they feel either that uh, a change in wording would strengthen the message or that a change in wording would uh, protect them in terms of, of perhaps making it a little less strong and putting the demand on them, uh, to lessening the, de the demand on them. Um, the, the, the fact that there are relatively few major responses from the agencies is a reflection of the fact that we have worked very closely with them in the development of the 
uh, message, so it's unlikely that they would take exception to a major piece of the message or a major thrust because they've had a chance to comment previously on the major components. The, the strongest objections come internally here in the White House from the other staff officers. The primary one is the, the, the primary office that we have problems with is the Office of Management and Budget, which is uh, uh, essentially the, uh, the, the budgetary function of the government, the people who have to worry about what it's all going to cost. One of Peter's proposals, or one of the things that the draft message suggested, was a fairly expansive view of United States involvement in international treatment efforts, that is to say, in the treatment efforts of other countries abroad. We felt a couple of things about that. We felt that the, first of all, that there were unknown dollars associated with that, that treatment is expensive, it's been expensive in the United States, and we did not want to see an open-ended commitment to treatment around the world without some specification of what would be the limits. We saw a budget threat there which we could not define and we thought the president ought to know that implicit in these words is a budget threat which is, has yet not been defined. From a policy standpoint, we theoretically have more power to influence the, the president in shaping policy. From a practical standpoint, OMB has an inordinate amount of power because they control the money. And I can make a policy decision and say, this is what we should do. Uh, but they can say, well, it will just cost too much. And they aren't disagreeing with me or disputing the policy decision. Uh, but they're making an argument that can be overwhelmingly persuasive. So whereas on a policy issue, I can, in effect, override what the agencies want to do by recommending to the president we should do this despite what the State Department or the Department of Health, and Edu Health Education and Welfare want to do. Um, and in general, I will prevail. When you're dealing with the budgetary issue, um, you've really got a whole separate set of considerations where they're quite likely to be able to override me uh, just on the basis of money. Presidential messages are policy. They aren't some person giving a speech to, the, to a local club. I mean, they are the president saying to the American people what he is going to do, and things flow from messages. Agencies change policies. Budget amendments and supplementals get submitted. Uh, Congress begins to think in some ways and not in others. Foreign nations do things. And therefore, every word is parsed. And what may seem like a nitpicking objection is important. See, with Alice, we have exactly we have diametric approach right. views on Treasury and Justice, uh, about the tax reform act. Uh -huh. Well, again, here it's talking about the same thing. Tax reform act study is promised. In the last two weeks, Treasury and Justice have had three meetings on this subject. In fact, I have to give Tim Baker a call. There's no certainty at the moment that Treasury and Justice cannot live with this legislation. Um, okay, the passports, that's an issue, right? That's an issue. I, let's say my gut reaction is that's, that could be deleted. Okay, um, the Attorney General uh, wants Tax Reform Act changed, and Treasury does not. Mm -hmm. Treasury. So, they're saying, well, be careful. Let's not put the president in a position where he's supporting this. Uh, Sybil, I spoke to Sarah, by the way. She said uh, the two of us should go over when the things are ready and wait. He's got, a, he's got an ambassador or somebody with him. Okay, we'll be just a minute. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the type of thing. So what they're saying is, well, be very careful. Let's not lock the administration into a position we haven't decided ourselves. And they should be the ones who, who would, would take the lead on this issue. Uh, there's a question of the Tax Reform Act. This is very sort of rather complicated, and that's why I, I think that it might be helpful if I go over with Sybil to, to 
Dr. Bourne's office, because here you have two sides again. You've got the confidentiality of taxpayers' information. Uh, what the law says now is that once I file, file my tax return, you, it's, you give it to the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, the Inland Revenue, and they keep it. And they can use it for their own purposes, but anybody else can't get to it, even the Justice Department or an, another investigatory agency of the federal government. And this is basically for the conf confidentiality of taxpayer records. I think it's, it's a valid fear. Uh, on the other hand, the people who would abuse this confidentiality are often the people who commit the, the really sophisticated crimes. The crimes such as uh, white collar crime or narcotics trafficking offenses where lots of money comes in. They just file their tax return, and this has happened recently, and they say earned income X amount of dollars, miscellaneous income, you know, X plus, X times five. Now, that's, they, for, they are technically conforming to the tax laws. They're, you know, admitting their income. Odds are it's probably under what they're really getting, but they're saying that we ha I have another income. But they're not telling you what it is, and they need not, and they pay taxes on that income. Well, this would be very interesting, say, to the Justice Department, who are investigating tax cases, tax fraud cases, as well as investigating, say, narcotic trafficking cases. So, uh, you have a confrontation there. The Treasury people say, well, this is a very good law. The point that we're at now is meshing policy decisions that we've made with the broader policy of the United States government. Up to this point, what we have been doing is evolving what we felt the drug policy should be, drawing on the resources of the different departments. Now we're to the point of meshing it with broader policy considerations, such as balancing the budget by 1980, which is a commitment that President Carter has made, broader foreign policy considerations, other laws which the Justice Department is promoting to deal with criminals outside of the drug area. And what we're in the middle of is a negotiation to make our policy acceptable or, or fit in with bro other broader policy considerations. Do you have a seating arrangement you'd like us to uh, adopt? Just as long as you don't sit in the, in the, in the, in the large chair. <laughs> Who should sign for um, Bob Pastor? Or does not need to be? But we have a document. Uh -huh. I, I'm not quite sure how it fits with our usual paper flow thing, and I'm not sure whether it's it's yeah. accepted etiquette to give him reading I, I tips. Why don't we hold back on that? What, what so about the briefing? Take a quick look. Sure. Hello. Hello, Mr. President. Please excuse me. Passing through. Yes, just passing <laughs> through. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. How are you, sir? All right, thank you for being my first route. <laughs> <laughs> there are people in the White House that smoke pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't smoke pot. Why can't it be legal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what it is, my president. You all earn the right to go away till that time. Amen. Peaceful. They got the clubs not us. Who are we scared? The marijuana laws are absurd today. They don't make any sense. Look at this. We have a thousand people openly smoking grass in the park, and the police wouldn't even think about making an arrest. They wouldn't dare come in here and arrest us. Across the street, the Carter boys smoke grass and they don't get arrested either. Now the only question I have left is, why the hell is marijuana still illegal? Everybody's smoking it, nobody's getting arrested in the park. What is this? 
We don't have to sit by and let other people make drug policy for us. Let's make our own drug policy in this country. When people see on television people outside the White House flagrantly smoking marijuana, people who, who look exactly like the kind of people that conservative America thinks smoke marijuana, um, it makes it that much more difficult for us then to get a, a decriminalization bill through the Congress because it builds opposition. If people think that the kind of people being arrested are nice middle-class kids, um, nothing really significantly uh, uh, different substantively, religious wording changes. It must be good to have six months of work. It does, it yes, it does. <laughs> let me let me go in here and then I'll be ready to get organized. For the president has essentially given his approval for Peter's um, uh, outline of, of what the narcotics policy will be. Uh, the memo has come back from the president with very minor changes, and uh, so I would I would say yes. This means that the policy is essentially um, finalized. The way we started the message was to solicit from each of the federal agencies their own input as to what they would like to see in the message. We then drafted up a sort of a laundry list of all the key issues that were felt to be important that we circulated around to everybody and people had an, an opportunity to object, add, say this is not a presidential level issue and we distilled the list down. We then had, uh, we took those issues and drafted the statement in a narrative form. And we produced a product uh, like this, which was then, uh, after considerable refinement by us, submitted to the president. He then went through it, made margin notes of various kinds, uh, made his own changes in the specific wording, added questions, and deleted certain phrases, particularly in the section on marijuana, that he didn't uh, want to include. Um, he then put a little cover note on it asking us to make the changes and get it back to him. We subsequently got it back to him uh, and got the next version, which was with his OK on it, saying that this version was fine. We then moved it into the formal drafted stage in the form that it will go as a message to the Congress. And this is the version that we now have finally um, with his name at the bottom. So this is his, his message to the Congress. And it will go up there uh, this afternoon to be delivered to the leaders of both of the houses of Congress. It will also go to each of the cabinet officers with specific items in this message that each cabinet officer is responsible for carrying out. Today I'm sending Congress a message which expresses my strong concern about the crime and sickness and death caused by the abuse of drugs, including barbiturates and alcohol. I'm ordering the Attorney General to concentrate on breaking the links between organized crime and drug traffic. We will not have an effective and united federal effort against drugs unless we reorganize the current federal effort, now divided among more than 20 different, often competing, non-cooperative agencies on occasion. Therefore, I'm directing my staff to eliminate this duplication and overlap and also to end the long-standing fragmentation among our international drug enforcement programs. In our own country, I'm ordering a study of how we can best control the abuse of barbiturates and other prescription drugs, which cause many deaths, while not interfering with their legitimate medical use. I support a change in law to end federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana, leaving the states free to adopt whatever laws they wish concerning marijuana. Decriminalization is not legalization. I do not condone any drug abuse, and we'll do everything possible to reduce the serious threat to our society. Federal civil penalties 
should be continued as a deterrent to the possession and use of marijuana. Drug research and treatment programs will also be improved to lessen the adverse effect of drugs on the lives of our people. But it's ultimately the strength of the people of our country, of our values and of our society that will determine whether we can be successful in our fight against drug abuse. The seriousness, the seriousness of this uh, problem has caused us all in the government this first six months of my own administration to try to come up with a coherent proposal to the Congress and with administrative action both within our own country and in our relations with other nations. The center of this effort now and in the future is and will be Dr. Peter Bourne, a man of uh, international uh, reputation and has been an expert in the control of the production, transport, and treatment of a drug problem. And Dr. Bourne is my personal advisor on this subject, and he will now be available to answer your questions about any aspects of, of the drug problem. Dr. Bourne. Thank you. I'd like to just introduce my deputy, Lee Dogoloff. And let me, just before we start taking questions, let me just draw your attention to this chart here. This chart shows the heroin purity levels uh, over the last seven years. As you can see, back in 1970, the purity level on the streets was 9.6%. This is the point at which the Turkish-French connection was broken. Hello, Ms. Minsky? Yes. Oh, uh, I'm calling in regard to the message that uh, came over our Warriors Wire, President Carter's proposal to reduce the federal penalties of marijuana law. Right, that was part of a drug message that went to Congress this afternoon. Yes. Uh, I had a couple of questions about that. Okay. Dr. Bourne, uh, given the magnitude of the drug problem, is it your uh, personal opinion that we should have uh, law authorities spend all the time it takes to track down marijuana when they could be devoting themselves to heroin? We don't feel that law enforcement agencies whose resources may be very limited should devote their time predominantly to dealing with a drug that may not cause that much of a hazard. And obviously, our priorities, as we have said in the message, are set based on determining which drugs pose the greatest health hazard to society and to the users. The press media coverage will be short and intense and will go away very quickly. What's more important is the long-term impact. I think the impact will be very great in this country. The people will then take this document as sort of the blueprint to refer to in terms of making policy decisions at a state level. Uh, it will be a blueprint that all of the cabinet officers will use in terms of determining their own internal policy in their departments. And I think other governments will look to it and try to relate their own governmental policies in such a way that they're consistent with the United States 